Good morning. Uh, today, we move in the direction that's, uh, that takes a big turn from the direction we've been going in so far. All the devices we had up to now, you know, resistors and uh, voltage sources and, uh, and even your digital devices like the uh, AND gate or the inverter and so on, had a very specific property. Okay, we didn't dwell on that property, but that property was that these were not what are called memory devices. In other words, the outputs at any given time <clears throat> are a function of the inputs alone. Okay, in other words, if you took your inverter or your NAND gate for that matter, and you built a circuit comprising 50 NAND gates uh, connected in structures that we've talked about, you apply an input and boom, you get an output. And your output is a function of the inputs alone. Right? Same way with your resistors and voltage sources. At any given point in time, your output, VO of T, was some function of the input, VI of T. <clears throat> what we're going to do today is discuss a new element, okay, which will introduce a whole new class of fun stuff for all of us to deal with. Okay, and, uh, and that's called storage. In other words, the output of a circuit is now going to depend not just on the inputs, but it's going to depend on the background, or it's going to depend on where the circuit has been in the past. Okay, so past is going to matter. Okay, it's a very fundamental difference. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I'll start by, you know, giving you folks a little bit of a surprise. So uh, I'm going to do a little demo, uh, taking two of your inverter circuits. So I'm going to start by taking a couple of inverters. Okay, remember I'm using this uh, structure here as an inverter. And uh, I'm going to couple this. to another inverter and take an output C, some Vs, some load resistance RL, uh, my B terminal and my A terminal. So I'm going to apply some input between ground and my A terminal. And uh, you know, for fun, I'm going to apply a square wave at the input, a square wave between 0 and 5 volts, and this is how my time goes. <clears throat> Let's assume that Vs is uh, 5 volts. So what I'm going to do is plot for you the behavior of this inverter. Okay? I'm going to plot for you A, which should look like this. I'm going to plot for you B, which should be an inverted waveform. And then plot C, which should be a waveform that looks like this again. All right, so let me uh, do a plot here. So this is A. and so on, time goes uh, this way. And that's said this is between 0 and 5 uh, volts. And B should be an inverted waveform that should look like this. If all that we believe of the world so far is true, then this is how things should behave. So C should look like this, right? Okay, so uh, this is what the world should look like, and if everything that you've learned about is true and, uh, and correct and all of the good stuff. So let me show you a little demo and see if I can try to pull the rug out from under all that you've learned so far, okay, and show you some, sort of, uh, some surprising stuff. So, uh, so up here, so here are the three waveforms that I show you up here. So this is my A. This is my uh, A waveform. 
Uh, this is the B waveform. Notice that B, as you expect, is an inverted form of A. And this is C. OK, we all expect this, correct? But what I'm going to do is let me expand the time scale on this so that I can look at these transitions a little bit more carefully. OK, I'm just going to expand the time scale. There you go. All of that is expand the time scale and spread that out a little bit. OK? And uh, what you see there is quite different from what you expect. OK? Uh, a is, you know, is a square wave as expected. But B is stunningly different. OK? It, it, it's a 0 as expected because this is a 1. But here, I get some really strange behavior. OK? A behavior that is like nothing on Earth, okay? like nothing we've seen before. And then, of course, it becomes a one eventually, but, but there's some really, really shady stuff going on here. Okay? And so far, you're not prepared to deal with this. Okay? We haven't uh, given, you the, given you the facility to deal with this issue. <clears throat> What's the problem with this? Now, we could say, who cares? You know? What's the problem with this? Let's look at, it, uh, let's look at the result. So I'm looking at this, uh, I'm focusing on this piece here, and notice that instead of being a sharp rise, it looks like this. Okay? It's going up a little bit more slowly. <clears throat> what kind of problem would that create? The problem that creates is the following. Okay, let me, let me play around with this graph a little bit more. What I'm going to do is just take this output here, the C output, and line it up against the A output. Okay? And so I'm going to line up the C waveform on top of the A waveform so you can see for yourself if something's really, really strange and nasty is happening. Okay? I, I'm just going to move up the C waveform and line it up. What's happening out there? If you look carefully, what you observe is that the C waveform transitions just ever so slightly later than the A waveform. OK? Look here. And I claim that it's because of this. Because of this, the C waveform writes, uh, uh, falls just a little bit later. OK, and that little thing we see out there is a delay. OK, so nothing you've learned so far prepares you for this. Suddenly, instead of the output exactly following the input, my output is following the input, but a little bit later. OK? And it is this fact here, it's this fact of life that things happen a little bit later is really the reason why each of you and all of us keeps buying new computers every couple of years. This simple basic fact. If this fact of life didn't exist, you would buy one computer and be done with it for life. OK, Intel would make a gob of, you know, gobs of money one year, and so would Dell, and, you know, Gateway, and so on, and then no more. That's it. This is it. But because there's little itty-bitty difference here, OK, our entire semiconductor, semiconductor technology is charging along trying to do something about that. You buy newer and newer computers each year. It turns out this little itty-bitty thing here, that is called the delay, the inverted delay. OK? And it happens because of a specific a uh, uh, specific element that has been introduced here that we haven't shown you so far. And a large part of a semiconductor industry and follow-on courses and design and so on focuses on how can I make my delay smaller? How can I get to a faster and faster and faster? Okay, this relates to how fast we can clock your Pentium 4. Do you remember it went from, uh, it came out at 1.3 gigahertz? What's the fastest Pentium uh, money can buy today? What, what's the fastest P4? Oh, 3.2s have come out? I don't know. Um, Ken claims 3.2. Uh, but yeah, there you go, 3.2 gigahertz. It's all got to do with this little itty-bitty thing. Okay? You saw it for the first time here. Okay, when some of you go become, you know, uh, CTOs at Intel and so on, just remember that it all began on October 16th, you know, with this little, little rinky-dink thing here. Okay, so what you're going to learn now is some really cool stuff. Okay, that has huge implications for life. 
so why does that happen? So why did this transition happen just a little bit later? Okay, the, the, rash, the reason is that, remember, when this waveform reaches Vt, the threshold voltage of this MOSFET, this guy is going to switch, right? So because of the, the slower rise of the voltage, the Vt is going to be reached ever so slight, a small amount of time later. Okay, so I'm going to hit Vt slightly later, and because of that, this guy is going to transition just a bit later. Okay, because this intermediate waveform B is slower, it hits Vt just a little bit later than if it would have made an instantaneous transition, and therefore my output falls just a little bit later, and this gives rise to my delay in the inverter. Okay, uh, we can call that T D if you like. Okay, some some delay. Okay, so uh, in your course notes, this material is covered in chapters nine and 10. So that was to kind of motivate why we're going to be doing all that we're doing for the next, next, okay. Uh, don't anybody come in, uh, come within a foot of this even by mistake. It's, uh, I, I, I don't mean it, it's, it's pretty deadly stuff. Okay. So, uh, So today we talk about the capacitor, okay? And in the next couple of lectures, I'm going to tie it all together and show you how this relates to that. Okay, show how, show, you know, shows, shows you exactly how the delay happens. You can compute it based on some simple principles that you learn about uh, in the next couple of lectures. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, show you I claim that that delay happens because of the presence of a capacitor in somewhere in there. Okay, what I'll do now is take you into a closer look, take a closer look at the MOSFET and show you where the capacitor is. So this is the MOSFET that you've seen so far, drain, gate, and source. Okay, this is a, this is called an N-channel MOSFET. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna do is dissect this and show you what's actually happening, what this looks like on uh, silicon, okay? So the MOSFET is, so here's my, uh, so here's my slab of silicon, okay, it's very thin. And uh, let's say this is, uh, I won't go into details here, you'll learn a lot more about this in uh, future device classes like uh, 301 or, and, and so on. But suffice it to say, I'll just introduce it here to give you a sense of where the capacitor is. So this is P-type uh, silicon. And the way you build a MOSFET is you create a couple of uh, tubs in which, which you dope uh, to be N-type. Okay, uh, the, the basic silicon here is doped P-type. And this guy here is uh, N-type. And what you do is a thin oxide layer is placed on top of that. And then, on top of that, a thin metal layer. Okay, this is a, a metal layer. This is a thin piece of oxide, silicon dioxide. Okay, and this is my P substrate. Now, this is a little metal layer that's really a wire on top of the silicon. Okay, this metal layer, you know, could be some sort of a wire that meanders around on the surface of silicon, and this is the wire that connects to the gate. This is the gate of my MOSFET, and uh, this guy here is the drain, and this guy here is the source, and this is my gate. Okay, so there's a little piece of metal here. This is this piece of metal here, and uh, there's a piece of uh, oxide, and then my silicon substrate. So notice that this is my oxide. Uh, when I apply a positive voltage to the gate here with respect to the substrate, what happens is that I draw up negative charges up, draw up electrons up here into this channel region, and I have corresponding plus type uh, out here so that uh, I get a view here that looks like a couple of plates, 
Okay, it's a couple of plates, and I end up with an oxide in the middle. There's no connection. Okay, two plates separated by a small distance. Okay, with plus Q and minus Q on the plates. And because of that, what ends up happening here is that this piece behaves like a capacitor. Okay, so you have a capacitor has two plates with a thin uh, uh, insulating material in the middle and uh, with some dielectric, uh, with, with some permittivity epsilon, and so I get a little piece of a capacitor here. Okay, that's the capacitor that has formed. Okay, I didn't set out to build that capacitor, but there is that capacitor nonetheless. So when I apply a positive voltage at the gate, uh, negative electrons are pulled up here, which forms a channel, and then uh, current can then flow, and that's how the MOSFET turns on. Okay, so n-type electrons back to n-type, and I get electron flow here, and that gives me my channel. This is just kind of, uh, you know, uh, devices in uh, four minutes or less. Uh, you will do an entire course uh, on this, if you like, you know, if you take 301. So uh, what we do is to be able to capture the behavior that we just saw, the funny delay behavior, we have to augment our model. We have to introduce a new element. Okay, so what we do is here's a MOSFET, gate, drain, and source. And notice here, we model this by putting a little capacitor, CGS, between our gate and the source. Okay, so uh, this becomes a simple model for our MOSFET device, which is uh, the good old the gate drain source device from the past, with a little capacitor, CGS, having some value uh, for CGS uh, in, you know, maybe uh, uh, 10 to the minus uh, 14 or thereabout, uh, thereabouts farads. So that's a little capacitor that has, that has come about in this, in this device that we fabricated here. So uh, it's that capacitor that is at the node B, between the node B and ground, because it's between the gate and the source of the second inverter. Okay, and it's that capacitor that's playing the, uh, the, the games that we saw uh, out there. So let's look at some of the behavior of a, uh, uh, an ideal linear capacitor. Um, so a capacitor, as I said, has a couple of plates. Uh, there are a couple of plates. Between the plates is some dielectric, uh, permittivity epsilon. Let's say the area of the plates is A, and let's say the plates are separated by a distance D. Okay, uh, I, I uh, get some charge here, uh, uh, let's say Q, so Q and minus Q on the capacitor. And uh, the capacitance C is given by epsilon A divided by D. Okay, but epsilon, as I said, is the uh, permittivity of the uh, dielectric. Okay, so if it's free space, then it would be epsilon zero, which is the permittivity of uh, free space. So that's the capacitance in uh, uh, farads. And the symbol uh, looks like this. Uh, capacitor C, voltage V, current I. So this, much like the resistor, voltage source, and so on, this now becomes a, now becomes a primitive element in your tool chest of elements, okay, like the voltage source and so on. Uh, capacitance with uh, the voltage V across it and a current I, and I've assigned the associated variables here uh, according to the associated variable discipline. Um, a question to ask, ask ourselves is, remember we said we're all now in a playground from you know, all of nature in, in, in this playground with a lump matter discipline holds. Okay, and re also remember that we said that the lump matter discipline to hold, we have to make a couple of assumptions. One of those assumptions was that dQ by dt for all our elements should be zero for all time. Okay, so right now, what about the capacitor? Okay, it's got some charge, Q. Okay, so charge must have built up somehow. Okay, so does that mean that I lied all along, that we're no longer in this playground, that we've been ejected from the playground because of the capacitor? Are, are, are we still in the circuit's playground 
in which, lumped, in which the lumped matter discipline holds and you know, all good things happen and so on. That seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? You know, I said, you know, I, I took you from Maxwell's uh, playgrounds to the ECS playground where I said the lumped matter discipline holds. And one of the foundations of the LMD was that dq by dt should be zero for all time inside the elements that we're going to deal with. And right now, boom, you know, it's, it's not uh, four weeks into the course, and, you know, Agarwal introduces an element, and psh, it's got Q in it. Okay, turns out that the capacitor also adheres to the lump matter discipline. Remember, the discipline says that dq by dt is zero for all time within elements. Okay, so I'm going to be clever. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose element boundaries in a very clever way. Notice that if I have Q here, okay, on this plate, then I get minus Q on the other plate. Okay, so if I, if I take the whole element, the element as a whole, okay, if, I, if I'm careful in terms of how I package my boundaries, okay, if I put both my plates inside my boundary, uh, my element boundary, then I still do get uh, the net charge being zero. Okay, so dq by dt is indeed zero for all time, provided I make sure that my element has both the plates. Okay, so, so therefore, if you come across somebody else that gives you an element that says, you know, I have an idea. Let's create a new branch of electrical engineering in which we model the capacitor not as one element with two plates, but let's build a capacitor, you know, by combining two new elements, okay, some two garbage elements called G1 and G2. But G1 is like the top plate, G2 is the bottom plate, I put them together, I get a capacitor. But notice, if I just pick one plate, then the element G1 will not adhere to the LMD. Okay, it adheres to the LMD because I choose my element boundaries in a way that both plates come within it. Okay? So, that's, so it's, it's very fundamental and key, and you can read a lot more about it in, uh, uh, in, in, in the course notes. Okay, so uh, I purposefully dwelt on that simple point because I think it's foundational and important, and you really need to understand that the capacitor does satisfy LMD. We are still in the good old playground. Okay, so uh, a few simple uh, facts here. Uh, these are in the notes, and you've also seen this before, I'm sure. Uh, I can relate the charge to the capacitance and the voltage as uh, Q is equal to uh, CV, and uh, Q is in coulombs. This is in farads, and this is in volts. Okay? So uh, uh, there is some charge Q stored on the capacitor and uh, it's in coulombs, and Q is equal to uh, CV. So I can, uh, uh, I can differentiate this with respect to time to get the current, and that becomes I is dQ by dt. So the current at any given time is uh, dQ by dt, and so I substitute for Q in terms of uh, CV here. That's what I get. Okay, so the current I is d by dt of CV, <clears throat> a 6002 assumption, okay? And, uh, capacitance in general can be time-varying, okay? I can get time-varying capacitors. In fact, uh, there are some sensors which are capacitive, and as I talk, my sound waves can change the pressure on the top plate of the capacitor and move the top plate of the capacitor, thereby changing the capacitance by moving the plate. Remember, uh, d here, as the plate moves closer, uh, I get a higher capacitance. So we won't be dealing, oh, unless explicitly said so, with time-varying capacitances. Okay, so what we can do is a 6002 assumption allows us to write C dV dt. Okay, so my current of the capacitor is C dV dt. Um, I can also write down the energy Capacitor stored energy, and energy is given by half CV squared. Okay, I'm sure you've seen all this before in physics and so on. So that's the amount of energy stored in the capacitor if it is holding a charge Q. So uh, let me do a little demonstration for you. 
So uh, our friend Lorenzo they don't make uh, glasses like they used to. So our friend Lorenzo has charged up this capacitor. Okay, it's a huge capacitor, and it's a 250 volt capacitor. Okay, so it's nasty. So uh, he's charged it up, and he's kept it there. And to show you that it does contain stored charge, it's been sitting there holding charge, right? Uh, um, maybe the first row should can just go backwards. Just step back for a second. I think you guys, you guys would be safe, but you know, uh, I just don't want to take any chances. So this, this, this is holding a bunch of charge. It's kind of sitting there. So if I short the terminals, it should, you know, uh, it should try to say, "Oh, I got a path. Let me get my charge out." So uh, all right, let's do it. This is always a scary moment for me, and I say, I say a little prayer uh, before I do this. Good? Okay. <laughs> Gee, you guys would love to see me getting fried, huh? All right, let's see. So it did contain charge. <laughs> shall, I, shall I just make sure? Okay. So there's a reason why Lorenzo puts one hand inside his pocket when he shorts it. Because uh, there's a natural tendency to hold the wire with both hands and say la 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 and go and put it across the capacitor. So by doing this, you're guaranteed that you know you'll just be using one, uh, you know, touching it with one hand. Okay. So uh, I think you, hopefully, you folks will remember for life that a capacitor can sit around you know, and hold its charge for a while. Okay. <clears throat> All right. That's enough for fun and games. So let's get on with the business of uh, building circuits. So what I'm going to do is, as I promised you. Um, I'm going to close the loop on that example uh, by, the, by halfway through the next lecture. Okay, so I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey involving capacitors and resistors and uh, involving some analysis, and then we'll close it all up for you in about the uh, middle of next lecture. So what I'd like to do next is here's a new element, okay, and, and let's do some fun stuff with the elements. Well, you know about voltage sources. You know about resistors. Let's put them together and see, you know, how they behave. Okay, so let's have a capacitor here, C, Vc of T, and some current I. Okay, what I'm going to do, in general, whenever I have something new or something strange, let's say like a capacitor or some other device, it's interesting to model the rest of the circuit behind it. Uh, if it contains only resistors and uh, uh, voltages and linear elements as a Thevenin equivalent. So let me do that. Okay, this is R. And this is uh, VI. Okay? So this stuff in the back is my standard pattern, voltage source in series with a resistor, and I connect that across my capacitor. By the way, remember, although you saw those funny waveforms and so on, the capacitor is a linear device, okay? Because you can see from here that the current relates to dV by dt, okay? That's a linear operation, okay? You don't see V squareds and, uh, and uh, uh, Vi's and uh, things like that in there. So it's a linear device. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so let's go back to a trusty old method, uh, uh, the node method. Okay, if you just blindly apply the node method and simply grunge through a bunch of math, you should be able to get to the answer. That is, for some voltage V or some form of voltage V, VI, I should be able to figure out what VC uh, looks like. So let's do that. So this is the, the node that's of interest here with the unknown node voltage VC. So let me apply the node method. So VC minus VI 
divided by r is the current going this way. That plus the current through the capacitor should equal zero. Okay? And what's the current through the capacitor? The node method tells me that uh, get the current in terms of the element values, right? So we know that the current is given by C dV dt. C dV C dt equals zero. All right? So uh, just um, shuffling things around a little bit, I can write RC dV C dt plus VC equals VI. So by writing the node equation, I then get the equation that characterizes this little circuit. Notice here that uh, this has units of volts, okay? And since I have time here, this also must have units of time. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go about solving this little circuit and understanding, uh, uh, understanding how it behaves. Uh, the specific example that we will look at looks like this. Let's say the capacitor voltage at time t equals zero is V zero. This is given. Okay? So at time t equal to zero, I'm telling you that the capacitor contains a charge. And because of that, there's a voltage V zero across it. That capacitor had uh, a voltage of 250 volts across it. In most of the uh, devices we deal with in laptops and so on today, like the Pentium 4, uh, voltages are on the order of uh, 1.5 volts, very, very small voltages, All right? And um, so that's my, the value in the capacitor, the voltage. That's called the state. This is called the state. Capacitor state, it's the state of the capacitor. And uh, I also give you that uh, VI of T is VI, okay? So my voltage is VI, <clears throat> and somehow, I'm not telling you how, but somehow I've arranged to have the capacitor voltage be V0 at time T equals zero. Okay, I want to look for the solution <coughs> to this for times T greater than or equal to zero. <clears throat> and in that time, my voltage VI is at uh, some capital VI, some DC voltage VI, okay? So I'm going to solve the differential equation RC dVC by dt plus VC equals VI. <clears throat> okay, given these two uh, uh, values, input is DC voltage VI and VC0 is V0, the initial charge in the capacitor. <clears throat> so to solve this, so from now on till, till the, uh, uh, almost till the end of the lecture, it's just going to be math about solving this very simple uh, first order differential equation. And the key here will be that throughout 6002, uh, we will be following uh, one method to solve these. There are many methods to solve differential equations, and we will follow one method. Uh, that method is called the method of homogeneous and particular solutions. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, in, uh, in 1802, I believe, you would have learned about uh, um, uh, maybe this and certainly other methods. Okay, you can use any method to solve it. Uh, we'll just stick to one method, and this is also used in the uh, course notes. So in this method, what we do, we take the solution we see by finding two other uh, components. One is called the homogeneous solution, and summing that up with the particular solution. <clears throat> and that's the total solution. <clears throat> the total solution is sum of the homogeneous and the particular solutions. And the method has three steps. Okay, as I said before, we will be using this method again and again with every differential equation that we encounter in this course. And you won't encounter a whole lot. So the first step, we find the particular solution. Okay, the second step, find the homogeneous solution, okay? The total solution is the sum of the two, okay? And then find there'll be some unknown constants, and depending on the equation that you have, 
And in the end, we simply find the unknown constants by applying the initial conditions that we have. Okay, boom, boom, boom. Particular, homogeneous, fine constants. Particular, homogeneous, fine constants. Three things. <clears throat> so let's go about solving this equation and apply those three uh, conditions. Again, remember, what I'm doing now for the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes, okay, is, is uh, using math that you know about to simply solve this first order differential equations. Okay, there's nothing really new that I'm going to talk about here. So one is to find the particular solution, VCP. Okay, and this will then be added into the VCH to get me the solution. So where you find the VCP is you find any solution that satisfies this equation. Okay, this is the equation. You find any solution that satisfies it. Okay, and find the simplest possible solution that money can buy and find it. That's a particular solution. Any solution, any solution is fine. So in this case, um, a really simple one would be VCP equals VI. Let's see if a constant works. Okay? One thing you will realize in, in, in differential equations is that they're actually much simpler than they seem. And the reason is that almost every time you have to assume you know the answer, okay, and then you're checking to see if what you assumed was correct. Okay, you, you assume the answer is this, okay, like you're really smart, and then check it out and say, oh, yeah, that must have been the answer. So here, uh, we assume that, you know, I think VI is going to work, so let's try it out. So um, substituting in here, so uh, RC, d by dt of VI is zero. VI is a constant. So I get VI equals VI, so therefore, this is a particular solution. Done. I substitute VI here. So dVI by dt is zero. So this vanishes. VI, VI equals VI. Bingo. So therefore, VI must, is a solution to this equation. So I'm done with my VCP. And in general, what you have to do is use trial and error. Okay? By trial and error, try out a bunch of solutions. Okay? Till you get lucky. Uh, in general, again, in all of 6002, uh, for many of the excitations, a simple constant usually suffices. Our second step is to find the homogeneous solution. And uh, we can also do that by uh, very quickly. And to do that, we have to find a general solution to the homogeneous equation. The homogeneous equation is the same differential equation, but with the drive set to zero. Okay, we're going to follow a set pattern to solve the differential, uh, differential equations here. And the set pattern is find VCP, VCH, find constants. And to find VCH, we're also going to follow a set pattern uh, to find the homogeneous solution. Okay? So uh, we set the drive to zero, so VI is set to be zero. And I need to find a general solution to this. So as I promised earlier, uh, diff equations are really, really simple because the way we're going to solve them is we're going to say, we, you know, assume we know the answer and then go check it. Okay? So, uh, Let's try a e to the st. Let's try and see if this uh, can solve uh, this particular equation, okay, for some values of a and s. Okay, so I'm telling you, okay, that uh, the solution is going to be of this form. Assume it. <coughs> and then uh, simply go ahead and find me a and s and do that by substituting it back into the equation and, uh, and uh, find out the corresponding A's and S's. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. So I get RC, I, I substitute this back up. So I get D of A e to the S T <coughs> DD plus A e to the S T equals zero. Okay, and uh, let me plug that in and uh, see what comes. So I get RC, that A, S, E to the ST plus A, E to the ST 
equals zero. Okay, I'm gonna discard the trivial solution uh, of A being zero. That's a trivial solution, so I'll discard that. And what I'll do is I'll cancel out the terms from, uh, cancel out the A's from here, assuming A is not zero, and cancel out E to the ST here, and what is left is RCS plus one equals zero. So what this is saying is that if I can find an A, I'm sorry, if I can find an S, if I can find an S such that this is true, then A e to the ST is a general solution to my homogeneous equation. Okay? And so S, this is easy enough, minus one by RC. So if I choose my S to be minus one by RC, then the simple math that I've gone through shows me that this must be the solution to the uh, homogeneous equation. Or in other words, VCH is equal to A e to the minus T divided by RC. Okay, all this is saying is that A e to the minus T by RC is a solution to my homogeneous equation. Um, A is an unknown constant. A is some constant. I don't know what that is yet. Okay? Uh, notice RC has popped up again. And the cool thing about RC is that this is time. This also has units of time. Okay, so we commonly represent RC as some time constant tau, as units of time. <coughs> so associated with that circuit is a time constant tau, which is simply RC. All right, so uh, I commonly write this as A e to the minus T divided by tau. So I'm very near the end here. So I have the particular solution here. I've got the homogeneous solution there. Okay? Oh, I need to make one more, uh, tell you about something else. And the way I found the homogeneous solution was in four steps. I assumed the solution of the form A e to the ST. I assumed the solution of the form A to the, e to the ST. Okay? Um, I created this equation here in S. Okay, this is called the this is called the characteristic equation for that circuit. Okay, we'll see this time and time again for RC and, and other forms of circuits. So uh, assume a solution of this form, construct the characteristic equation, okay, find the roots of the characteristic equation. In this case it's an equation in S, so this is the root and then uh, form the solution based on that root. Okay, four steps. A e to the ST, characteristic equation, root, and then write down the homogeneous, the general homogeneous solution. Four steps there, okay? And finally, I want to write down the total solution. And the total solution is simply VCP plus uh, a VCH, and VCP was VI, and VCH was A e to the minus T by tau. Okay? Uh, tau is simply RC. That's my solution. Now, remember the last step. Last step was form the total solution and find out the remaining constants. And I'll find out the remaining constants by using my initial conditions. So I know at t equals zero, I know that vc equals v naught. Okay, I know that. And so therefore, I can substitute t equals zero to find the constant. So I know that vc is v naught at t equals zero. So at t equals zero, this thing becomes one and so I get this equation, and from which I get A to be V naught minus VI. All right, in other words, my solution VC is simply VI plus V naught minus VI e to the minus T divided by tau. Okay, so the last 15 minutes have just been math. Okay, no electrical engineering here, but uh, electrical engineering stopped at the point it wrote this differential equation down. 
went through a bunch of math and came up with the solution. Okay, purely mathematically. Okay, so here I simply use math to get you the solution. And as I've been promising you throughout this course, uh, in the next lecture, I will give you an intuitive EE method of doing it, okay? Uh, real electrical engineers, uh, e real EECS folks, don't do it this way. Okay, real EECS folks do it intuitively. Okay, and I'll show you how to do it in four easy, or four, four easy seconds in, in the next lecture. Okay, but you need to understand the foundations of how this comes about, and so this is the answer. All right, you can also get the current. IC is simply C dVc by dt. I won't do that for you, but you can simply uh, differentiate it and uh, get the current. So I can plot, I can plot for you Vc time t Vc. Um, the intuitive way of looking at this is I have Vi, which is the final value of the voltage. Okay, when t is infinity, okay, my volt, uh, this part goes to zero, so the output is simply, or the Vc is simply Vi. And then there's a component V0 minus Vi, which decays according to this, starting out at an initial value of V0. Notice when t is zero, Vc is V0. You can see that in the equation. And so it starts out at V0, ends up at Vi. I start here, I end up here, and this portion, V0 minus Vi, decays out over time, like this. Okay, and this decay is governed by the RC time constant, or tau. Okay, so I'm gonna show you very quickly a couple of uh, examples of uh, uh, waveforms one that goes like this, and one that looks like this. Uh, this is when I start with some value V0, and I don't apply any input. It should decay down to zero. T, T, Vc, Vc. Okay, so if I apply zero for Vi, then this should simply decay down to uh, nothing over time. And if I apply some Vi, but there's no state on the capacitor, okay? Then that same equation is gonna look like this. Okay, you can go and confirm for yourselves that when I apply some input, but the capacitor has zero state, I start at zero, I finish up at VI, and my waveform looks like this. So there you go, so that's the first one. The second one where I have five volts on the capacitor, I'm sorry, but I have, uh, right, five volts on the capacitor and no input, and then I watch, so assume that at time t equals zero, I take away an input, short my voltage, the input voltage to ground, for example, apply zero volts. You see the decay from five volts to zero volts. And in the first case, in the first case, I start with zero volts on my capacitor, I apply an input of five volts, and notice that at t equals zero, and notice that the capacitor rises up to that level. So notice that these circuits with capacitor and resistors are typified by waveforms that are exponential rises and exponential decays. Okay, we'll see more of that next time. 